Hello, I'm Maud Morgan, uh, companion of Set and Knight of Shambhala, and this is the Egyptian Magic Podcast. The topic for this particular uh, recording is uh, the goddess Renenotet of uh, ancient Egypt, who is also a serpent goddess, so the topic is also related to serpent goddesses in religion, but also, I guess, within magic, broadly speaking, covers quite a lot of different material. Okay, so Renenotet, uh, the serpent goddess of Egypt. This is actually the month dedicated to the, this particular goddess. As I've kind of pointed out, several times you can derive a ritual cycle just from looking at the egyptian calendar especially the older form of it in the uh, lunar uh, incarnation the lunar calendar and various months within the the year are named after particular gods or goddesses some of them have lost that uh, in in terms of the egyptian records and were replaced often by the name of a pharaoh in one particular case or sometimes the name is transferred in certain way or sometimes it's more like instead of the name of a a god or goddess it might be the name of a particular time of year like the fire festival is a is a good one a good example of that the lesser burning and the greater burning those are both later months names within egypt uh but if you go back uh far enough within the the tradition to about the building of the first of the great pyramids the uh, pyramid of josa certainly around then you can the, the, it's much clearer that there is this connection between particular gods and goddesses and particular months of of the year whole months so in some sort of ritual uh calendars that people use there would be um how can how can i put it the the later civil civil year people kind of sometimes use uh, an almanac uh, a later almanac which has ritual days devoted to particular gods and goddesses quite a, kind of a whole cycle of them particular days that is but in a sense that is there's some sort of indication and there is some sort of overlap but there, there certainly you would have a much longer period to particular important gods and goddesses than just a single day although one particular day like the full moon or the new moon might be of particular significance uh, basically the the whole month or the whole build up to that cycle would be devoted to a particular day so taking all those things together you can or i i managed to do derive a kind of a pantheon really a collection of lunar orientated uh gods and goddesses from ancient egypt um uh, and often there is a connection between all of them there, the this wood calendar wouldn't have applied to everywhere in Egypt because uh, the the way the, the system would be organized is that particular areas, particular regions would have their special god or goddess, whether that's Hathor or um, Set in some cases or or Horus or whatever, then the, 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 that would tend to kind of mold the way that their calendar worked as well uh, and it would give it certain precedence to that thing. But one way or another, there is a whole month uh, that, that takes its name from the goddess Renenotet. Uh, and there's quite a lot of mythology and, and magic connected with her. And the, one of the interesting things, I guess, uh, about her is, is that she has this serpent form. And through studying Renenotet, it's obviously quite an ancient goddess, but you, you, you can't miss it if you spend a certain amount of time studying the uh, Egyptian records, uh, Egyptian mythical texts, that serpent lore of one sort or another or, uh, plays kind of quite a, a major part in it. You know, you, you, I, I, you can think of these images of the 
obviously the the pharaoh that have a, a cobra sort of placed in in the center of the forehead on a kind of diadem or actually foot but sort of come in the curb serpents actually wrapped around their head and this is obviously related as well to the the cult of Renanotet and to the serpent cult all these different things kind of imply that if you went back to an older strata of belief in Egypt there was quite a powerful um, serpent cult uh, in operation and that that would be the case for all sorts of other countries and, and cultures as well that the serpent cult is all, is almost there in fact it's often said that one of the important aspects of training of the of the magician or the scribe stroke magicians of of egypt is is knowledge of the the alphabet of birds and snakes uh, because if you look at the uh, the egyptian hieroglyphic alphabet what one of the things that does jump out of you is how many of the letters are actually either snakes in one form or another or curled up or rearing up or whatever and birds uh, and so in slang obviously amongst the scribes themselves they call what they were learning the the the, the knowledge the wisdom of birds and snakes meaning the alphabet which is the primary thing that the, that they they studied obviously as, as scribes but there's, there's obviously much more to it than that and renenetet is 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 a kind of serpent goddess as well so i should also say that one of the things that uh arises in this is that you have renenotet this famous image connected with the harvest i think as well coming at this time of year uh, you would think of it as we've had months that were connected with the burning of the stubble i guess the connection with the with the harvest and the harvested fields which is a source of well-being uh, and wealth uh, within any society really and the association between uh, serpents and and the harvest is quite a kind of well attested one uh, so, so common that you might actually think that that's kind of fairly ubiquitous it's not even interesting that that serpents uh, are in the fields uh in a benign family they're probably they're, they're essentially most of the serpents in in the cultivated fields are there hunting the the small rodents and animals that are, are there wanting to eat the kind of the, the crops themselves so there's a kind of reciprocal arrangement between all these different creatures that you find there and that's that's one likely reason why there's a strong association between rent and upset and the months and the the harvest and the fields and, and all the rest uh, there's more to it than that though that, that that's obviously an important relationship she's also connected with said to be connected with clothing and uh, of one sort or another and personally i think that connection of her with clothing is to do with the fact that uh, in a sense that she sheds uh, serpents shed their skin every year so this, this is like changing their clothes essentially would be a way of uh, that one might look at it and so by kind of sympathetic association she's associated with clothing so that's one of her important things um i was looking at some new material that that came up that might you know one of the things obviously if you're going to find a serpent in the fields you want them especially if they might be venomous serpents and there are venomous obviously the 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 the, the cobra the spitting cobra or just the cobra itself is a well-known venomous serpent and you, if you come across this by accident you the the, the obvious kind of uh, thought if you like to, to, is that she would arise that she wouldn't be aggressive 
it always envisaged as a, as a female thing that the, the, the benign serpent is going to rise, it's gonna, you're going to wake them up or they're going to come out of their hibernation, out of their kind of, um, out of the earth, because they're also envisaged as being the creation of uh, Geb, the earth god, because of the fact that they most commonly burrow and live in caves and, and, and holes that they've they've kind of bored into into the ground and into the loose soil in the fields. So when they do arise from uh, resting in, in, in either hibernating or just from being there, the the key thing is that they they they're called upon to to rise to, to wake up in a state of peace so that they don't attack you. So you call upon them to be peaceful. Uh, so the, the, in the words of the prayer, may you awake in peace. Renanatet snake, the Renanatet snake awakes in peace. Uh, may your awakening be peaceful. There's this kind of rhythmic thing here, this repetition. Uh, for Renanatet, the priestess is holding you. Your mouth kissing my skin as I sleep in your temple. That's a, another kind of idea that sleeping in the temple um, would be somehow connected with, with so it's possible that certain temples that in order to engender a, a particular state of mind a prophetic state of mind which might manifest in dreams that there would be the pre presence of serpents of one sort or another hopefully not too venomous in in the serpent and just their very presence and thought and image would be a way that um of of incubating or provoking a prophetic dream uh in the traditional prayer winding the serpents of linen around my head so like the bandages that are used to wrap around the head and to wrap the mummy they are the, themselves compared to uh serpents uh and snakes uh they're called the garments of renotet which is another reason why there's an association between uh, snakes and linen and, and cloth apart from the thing I, I, I mentioned about the shedding of the skin uh, the fact that she has new clothes this long very long bandage that is used to mummify to wrap the mummy up in so she's got this association as a goddess of the dead and you know she, you often say you are me and I am you that's a nice idea um uh, Got to say, goddess of the dead sort of uh, offerings are made for her uh, on behalf of everybody, primarily by the king, but who is in the holy country, the great revered one of the necropolis. So she's associated with the cemetery, the necropolis, uh, as the mistress of the uh, city of eternity. It This could be because... So we, we talk about several several times that say in a place like uh, Thebes in Upper Egypt uh, nowadays called Luxor, across the the river in uh, on the west bank is the the city of the dead essentially the you know, uh, valley of the kings and valley of the queens, and this is otherwise quite a kind of remote uh, arid area outside of the cultivated fields, but there are apparently there are serpents up there as well. Uh, that live in the in in the caves in the rock, which essentially they might even live in the in in the excavated caves, which is essentially what the what what the tombs are, and that maybe for some reason an ancient uh, connection between this great mountain and serpents. So there is a mistress of the mountain who is personified as a serpent uh, with another name. Um, Merit Sega, which uh, means she who love, loves silence. And these places are quite, uh, actually quite remote, quite silent places. And she, she likes it that way. And she's often addressed as the one who likes silence. And there are various um, kind of little sort of objects, Stelle, that are left out for 
forerunner attack by the the workers the ancient workers in fact uh, from the ancient city of Dera, Dera Medina for instance which was a kind of a, an old city that was a, a special city of work workmen uh, and women who uh, constructed the tombs and all the beautiful things and uh, as you can see in the image behind me uh, that were painted on the tombs this is actually I think from uh, the tomb of uh, Ramesses the sixth probably or one of the Ramesses tombs I should check that but uh, the workmen who built this because there's a certain trade secrets you say and certain secrets about who is buried there and the uh, they're dealing with precious uh, objects and and and, so, and metals and substances. So for for one reason or all, must maybe just for pure convenience, because such a lot of tombs have to be made, not just the royal tombs but all the other ones. That uh, it, a colony, if you like, an ancient colony of tradesmen, of masons and sculptors and painters and scribes to some extent were all lived together in this kind of rather lively village in it and, and some people implied that they were kind of not allowed really to move outside of that area so the, the this is very handy from our because you have this uh surviving village and, and all sorts of records and they use their skills to decorate their own tombs as well and i mentioned that because as well they're obviously aware of this goddess Renenotet uh, Marat Sega, uh, the goddess of the mountain. And because so much of their time was spent wandering across this region, they made certain offerings uh, of beer usually, and of uh, they made little stele with prayers on them to keep her on side one way or another. So, Okay, she's known as the mother walking in the fields, the, the connection here with a good harvest, uh, harvest rather the harvest is good because of reciting offerings to her. So in a, a way there becomes this sympathetic idea between the idea of snakes in the fields, benign snakes and the kind of, uh, the kind of the size of the harvest, the beneficent harvest that, that comes through. She's also uh, addressed as Neheb Kau, the kind of uh, master, mistress of doubles in, in, in images, which, who is also shown as a very ancient, almost demonic um, serpent within the Egyptian tradition, who at some point in the long history of Egypt is kind of, uh, the way they put this, is brought on side. Uh, one more and us he's brought into he is brought into into in from the cold if you like from being a, a an enemy of uh slightly chaotic of the gods to being um to be to being part of the of the system and there there are uh, he's never have cow is one of this kind of collection of uh deities ancient serpent deities some of which are never going to be brought on size uh, so i was looking at this um collection of because wherever you get snakes you get people who, you, you always need people who are uh, uh, experts at dealing with snakes and wrangling them as it's called or handling them and there's a whole clan of people who's uh, who are expert at this kind of thing and uh, they've left their their books about them you know there are kind of ancient texts that explain their skills for, for for those who want to know them and they classify all the different snakes and one of the older snakes is this uh snake apophis or apep uh, who ha who has a uh a, a real snake as a a kind of avatar if you like the, the, this snake is whereas most of the other snakes have can be dangerous and uh, it has some sort of therapies for that the, if you get bitten by the apophis snake, you, you have no chance at all, really. There's no possible cure. It's completely dead, deadly. Uh, an interesting thing, it says, Renanotet, who entered me on the day of my birth. 
be with me at the end in the hall of justice and throughout my life supporting me in life and in the underworld and support me after death uh, as the sort of genius of the gods so there's quite a lot of different aspects to that um that on the day of your birth the the serpent enters into you and i suppose on a kind of practical level you would say that um, inside you are these kind of very snake-like um and you know intestines and all, all the things in, in inside that you know so that there's definitely an idea in ancient anatomy that these are kind of manifestations of the serpent energy as well in fact in other places the serpent a pair above this is is also the name given to the umbilical cord which is again another snake-like um kind of piece of anatomy that connects you to uh the afterbirth which and this connection between you and the afterbirth because sometimes the 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 placenta is also has a is connected with your sort of double it's almost like the you come out as a as a baby and you're connected by this serpent to this um other kind of i don't know almost like another entity which is this one way of doing it which is the afterbirth and sometimes it's it's likened to the car or double of a human being so that uh some of these ideas we kind of might think of that are a bit literal but this sort of earthy way of looking at things is it it obviously uh is part of the system if you look uh, on the, the wall that's i'm using as the as the background you've got a small section from the uh i think from the the book of earth um and the book of earth is usually one of these uh, underworld books from ancient egypt that, that is figures that occurs within the the very center of the tomb the kind of powerhouse of the tomb itself uh a sarcophagus chamber the 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 texts that surround the the body are, are obviously very very significant texts and the book of earth is is one of those and the, this figure as it happens that it's just behind me but i'll i'll put it i'll reproduce it as well is easy to take for granted it's it's actually called the mysterious woman the mysterious lady if you like and she is shown uh kind of flanked by two serpents that are standing on their on their tails and there are various other serpents there as you can see i'm kind of moving to one side to show you uh, and that believe it or not has been identified as a as an image of uh the body in the it, the internal organs of the body especially the reproductive center and this is why it is thought to be legitimate to think about uh the fact that in egypt there was a definite mystery of the of, of the internal body uh, and which reminds us a lot of some of the later writings that you thought that are well known from india in fact of things like uh, kundalini which is a a serpent power that rises up in the body and earlier i mentioned the urea serpent that appears on the forehead and of, of certain pharaohs and certain headdresses and it's, it is a kind of a uh, remarkable coincidence that this it, it draws attention to the center of the forehead which uh we we otherwise we kind of don't really think about anything uh an, anatomy wise as being there but uh, but in terms of sort of psychic anatomy there is definitely this idea from many many different cultures of of a of the serpent power having a manifestation there we know this from later tantric texts such as the serpent power which describe these serpentine energies within the body 
and do sort of help us to understand what the uh, Egyptians might have been getting at as well, because they have similar ways of looking at things, uh, surprisingly enough. enough. The, the serpents being on the left or the right, that connection is, is never arbitrary within the Egyptian tradition. Uh, there, there's is significant, and there, there's an idea that the uh, on one side of the womb, in fact, if conception takes place on one side of the womb, it will be a male child. If it takes place on the uh, right hand side of the womb, it will be a female side. That kind of thing, uh, and that kind of piece of anatomical knowledge gets is it, not just Egyptian. That's kind of You'll find that in later Greek uh, anatomical texts. You'll find it in uh, Indian texts as well. This kind of relationship between the different sides of the body, between the, the reproductive center, and these kind of visitors, these serpentine energies flowing through the body. So, Renanatet is uh, the serpent goddess, very connected with this sort of stuff. In fact, that image of the mysterious woman who's uh, otherwise we don't know we we could almost say that that is another representation of Renatet. and of course in all of these underworld books the gatekeepers of the, so you, you have this idea that you're moving through essentially you it, it's like you're moving through the body in a way but the, but the, it's sort of microcosmic way but you're moving through your own body or through some sort of psychic body and there are di there are different points which uh, are referred to as chambers or caverns or spheres or whatever and there are always gateways between these di different places different doorways and those doorways are always uh, guarded by particular serpent uh, entities of one sort or another who have no names and uh, perform certain tasks. So the whole of the underworld books, one of the things that do stick out quite a lot within these traditions is this uh, whole mystery tradition of what we might in later times have called the serpent power. The serpent power was something that was very well known within uh, the Egyptian tradition by the look of it, but it's, it, this, the knowledge of this is, is uh, has to to be reconstructed or for, to some extent from from later stuff but the the number of serpent images that for, that play a part in describing important mysteries there I, is quite significant so on the day of birth which is probably a reference to the uh the process of birth and uh, the umbilical cord and the rest renenote enters into a person so there's a internal aspect to this uh, and she stays with you throughout your life and she'll be there at the end uh, in the un the underworld journey she is she is there throughout your life supporting you after death as the genius the spirit of the gods which is interesting because there's another form of nanotech from the serpent goddess from later times which was the serpent that represents the city most famously but other cities as well of alexandria uh in egypt's delta region which has a kind of genius a good agathon uh daemon of the city which is represented as a uh, as a serpent goddess and there's the there are accompanied by a, a second serpent as well which is a goddess of faint fate uh, so there's a connection between Ronenotet and a person's fate, uh, which is what it's referring to here as something that enters at birth, because a person's birth within the Egyptian way of looking at things is something that is manifested, how, how their life is going to go uh, is manifested at the, at the moment of birth, either as a, a prophecy or a an interpretation of, uh, of of stellar law as you might find in astrology or or just as the fact that the 
the, the, the serpent genius enters the body at birth, as it's seen that way. These are quite unusual mysteries within um, Egyptian tradition. Okay, so Renanotet, uh, who is perhaps the same, uh, another name for her from the Greek tradition is Thermutis. So this serpent cult that uh, we can trace its origins to a very, very old strata of belief in Egypt. Uh, gets taken over in the Greek world as well, and they have their own name. Thermutis is a kind of variation on the name Renanotech, also Meret Sega. Uh, so it's the eighth month of the year, so around about February, March. Uh, as I say, this is difficult to put an exact date on it because we're talking about a lunar calendar and there's a certain amount of slippies backwards and forwards. She's an ancient serpent goddess associated with the harvest, but also weaving, which is something we had mentioned before, and linen. The usual form is that of a woman wearing a headdress uh, in the form of a uraeus serpent, a serpent kind of rising up, or as a large snake wearing, actually as a snake wearing the solar crown and the, the cow's horn, which is kind of a, a strange image. Uh, as I say, the association of snakes with the harvested, harvested fields is perhaps universal everywhere, really. Uh, she is the mother of another mysterious serpent deity, Neheb Cow. So, uh, she may even share something with the scorpion goddess, uh, Selket, uh, also said to be sometimes the mother of, the, of, of uh, Neheb Cow. So they're both said to be the mother of this a uh, strange, once upon a time, demonic serpent Neheb Kal. Uh, both goddesses feed and nurture the future king one way or another. So the serpents are for popular beliefs, but they're very much associated with protection of the king, which is why the Egyptian kings are often shown with this protective image. Now, Salket is actually a non-venomous uh, scorpion type uh deity um associated with other perhaps because she's a scorpion that looks like a scorpion but isn't actually venomous that gives you the idea that uh you know it's, it's appropriate for actual venomous serpents and uh and stinging things and snakes and scorpions and the Cast of people who wrangle and look after an experts on snakes are actually usually seen as uh, part of the clan of Selket, the scorpion goddess. So there's a obvious overlap between the two goddesses. Perhaps you might say Renenotet is uh, essentially thought of as a benign, non-venomous serpent, although you can't rely on this too much. Uh, the cult practices, well, there's quite a lot you can find, but it takes takes a while to dig them out. Uh, there's a, some sort of feast, usually involving fire. There's sometimes there's a production of a a corn mummy called a, a Nipa doll, or sort of like a voodoo doll, really. I think this is because of, it's a mummy because of the wrapping around it of the serpentine bandages. They, these were small dolls made of soil mixed with grain and wrapped in linen and that were buried in the fields. Uh, this also connects later on with the cult of Osiris. Uh, I think as well something something to do with the the, the festival to, of uh, kingship, uh, the the jubilee of the, of the king, because it involves some sort of circling and spiraling around the fields, that might also be an association with this particular goddess. So there are plenty of um, magical things that you could be done to, I suppose you rely on the serpent goddess to, to, to rid ourselves of the kind of bad things that might be lurking in the fields as well. So I, I mentioned the uh, workmen, the sculptures and the uh, painters who made the kind of uh, beautiful tomb that you see behind me. 
they were all of them in that village were one way or another were devoted to Ranotet. Uh, they saw her as an important uh, goddess, perhaps because of the association with mummification, uh, the wrapping, but also because of the environment I think that they lived in. Uh, and they live, live quite personal uh, prayers to her. So it's not all about the elite stuff. This is a kind of folk magic, if you like. You make a little image of the serpent goddess. Uh, and one of these rather nice ones that I saw the other day, Renenotet, the beautiful, the Clement. Uh, this object is made for the sculpture Ken, who is justified, you know, he's meeting before God, perhaps he's departed, or he's just leaving it to say, I'm a justified person. I follow uh, the, the way of Mart. And he says to her in this offering, Renenotet the Beautiful, the Maret Sega, to so have the two names together that shows you that the same mistress of heaven, so she's to do with the stars in heaven, regent of the gods, so she's uh, associated with the benign one, the one who returns always in clemency, in a good mood, the beautiful mistress who is appeased. To worship you, mother, the beautiful one, the mistress of food, I say, come back to me every year in peace. And by your car, you yourself will be appeased. And you, so then the sculpture ad addresses me or you who might be passing this object on the road to the Valley of the Kings, which is a rather nice pathway across the mountains from, from the, the village to uh, the place of work, which is uh, either the Valley of the Kings or the Valley of the Queens uh, and other valleys uh, accessible going a little bit further along. So you come across this and it, it addresses you, every man who comes upon this uh, object, this epitaph, make an offering of beer for Renenotet and do that in the first months of winter on the 20th day. Uh, and do, don't be careless, don't, don't hold back, take heed of her uh, and then you will be fine. So the other thing I wanted to, uh, to go a little bit more into, I, I talked a little bit about these um, what they call ophiology, the, or, or, or the the science of snakes, uh, which was a big thing in uh, ancient Egypt. Uh, they were famous for their knowledge of serpent law uh, as a metaphysical thing, but also as a practical thing. Uh, they they were reputed to be very good at uh, dealing with snake bites and uh, venom and um, capturing the snakes themselves uh, and not surprisingly there is this great tome or papyrus uh, that sets out um, what survival of it, it, it the different snakes and, and what to expect from them um, so for instance the red hennep snake uh, which is actually white throughout its length, as, as according to this manual, but there are many red spots along its body. Uh, it holds its head up high, it rears up, its neck is narrow and its tail is very thick. Uh, it doesn't see very well uh, and it doesn't hear very well. Uh, and you can tell if this snake is, you know, if it's this particular snake, by analyzing the, the pattern of bite marks that you get uh, from the snake. If you get three punches uh, in, showing on the bite, then, uh, then you know you've been bitten by this particular snake. You shouldn't run away. Uh, but if, you, if someone who's bitten, they will kind of uh, lose their strength. <clears throat> Uh, and there's a kind of rather strange thing to do, which is to uh, ask them to kind of eat and lick or touch, probably. It says strike them, them with their mouth with copper, which I think what it means. 
as long as they don't fall to the ground, so as long as they've got a certain amount of strength left, the person who's been bitten by the snake will actually live. Uh, but they will be feverish for nine days. So this is a sort of text that you get, you get which goes on. The, the thing I thought was very interesting, uh, the, it, it says literally in this text that this comes out of Seth's phallus. I don't think it means it literally comes out <laughs> as, as a snake. I think what it's referring to is the fact that it's the it's one of the objects it's one of the cr creatures in the world that are thought of as the creation of a snake the, of uh, set so what comes out of his phallus is his semen of course and the semen being he engenders things so this particular snake is the is the progeny of set really is the creation of snake of set uh, but even so and we've talked about set many, many times in 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 the course of this. Uh, even though it comes out of, of set and it, it's potentially dangerous, it's not fatal. There is a cure for it, unlike the apophis snake, which um, there's no cure for it. You know, once you're bitten by that snake, you're finished, basically. Another one, it talks about the the male viper. Uh, I so say this is real knowledge. It, uh, the other stuff is real knowledge, but I mean real practical knowledge, not just metaphysical knowledge. The male viper, also a red hennep snake, is very common in Egypt, we're told. Uh, wherever it bites you, it, it's, it swells, but it will not fill up with blood, which is what some of the other snake bites do. Uh, and you won't go numb, right, which is another kind of... Uh, side effect of, of snake bite by and you can be saved given the right uh therapy and some of the therapies are actual practical things as it says so uh, you can kind of clean the wound out debride it as it says with it with a knife to, to clean it up and there also will be um maybe a magical inc incantation which we might kind of use which is often connected with the mythology of uh, Horus and Set funny enough because so much of the mythology involves episodes with serpent law uh, especially with um, Horus and Set and, and, and their uh, Isis the sister of one and wife of the other so this, this snake as well is also thought of as a, as a manifestation of the god set. Uh, but it also says it, it could also just as easily be a manifestation of the god Geb. So all of the serpents in Egypt have a divine uh, avatar, you might say, a divine form. Every god and goddess has their own corresponding serpent. So which underlines this idea that uh, Egypt serpent law is a, a very old strata of belief, uh, and the, all of the gods, as we might say, that all of the gods and goddesses of Egypt had a kind of, uh, to use a scary word, a demonic form, uh, but perhaps doesn't mean quite the same thing that that came to mean in a later time. Uh, they would also have a a serpentine form. Which it might be their oldest form. In some texts, it says the oldest form of all the gods and goddesses is uh, as a serpent. Uh, there is a very famous text from Esna, I think, about Amun saying that he's going to leave the temple eventually and, and return to his original form, which is as a, uh, again as a snake. So all of these, the mythology, one way or another, will have this serpent law to it. Will take us back to a, a a serpent mythology, one way or another. And if you look at the texts of the decans, which is an in, in, important timing aspect and an aspect to do with people's fate, that uh, comes from ancient Egypt, this sort of ten-day period. Uh, ruled over by certain um, stars but also personified as a particular entity Mo very many of the personifications of the 
the Decanor spirits do look quite demonic and they are in a serpent form. So again, the, the Decanor thing is another piece of serpent law that connects us with uh, this, this whole piece of mythology, this whole kind of mystery really underlying this. So you've got a kind of bodily aspect to it. We've talked about the kind of equivalent, Egyptian equivalent of uh, Kundalini and uh, to give it a Hindu, later Hindu term, uh, but they had their own terms for it in terms of these serpents that arise within the body. It has a, a, a connection with demonic law outside and with the kind of passage of the stars and the uh, Deccan, especially the Decanor system. It, it has a connection with mummification, with kingship. So all in all, you can see how Renenotet is one of the oldest goddesses uh, and divine entities within the Egyptian tradition, and also a really, really important one, and one whose mysteries continues uh, into the, the Greek world, perhaps even from, from uh, other traditions, and from there comes down to us through all sorts of other stuff. So important uh, material is, I'll leave then with a uh, a prayer. Uh, I should say as well that the, the connection, this prayer starts, how beautiful is Sobek, and Sobek is connected with the uh, an area in Egypt uh, known as the Fayum, uh, which is a kind of dried out ocean, basically, or colossal inland lake, uh, Crocodile City, or in in the fight in the Fayum. And I think Rodanotet was was very very popular there. I should say one important aspect as well. We talked about serpents, and uh, we talked about. Renenotet, but there are also a thing called the four Renenotets. Renenotet in fourfold. And anything that's fourfold, uh, four, will naturally lend itself to uh, the four directions or the four corners uh, of a room or, or of a temple. And then a very, very many uh, uh, prayers and invocations and scenes devoted to the four Renenotets. So, so they come four of them together. It's quite alarming. But uh, so in personal folklore, uh, the four directions of the funny enough of the bedroom. So we talked about the personal um, aspect of things. You know the uh, the 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 question of birth and and uh, whatever. But the there is old spells in which four different uh, rearing cobras are placed, are formed in, into lamps uh, to light the four corners of the world, of, of a room and to add protection to the person uh, who might be sleeping in the bed, but also who might be giving birth in that room. So the four renotets are an in, uh, incredibly important part of the mystery as, as well, and fourfold meaning kind of also, anything fourfold, it means it kind of extends to infinity, one way or another, the four directions. Okay, how beautiful is Sobek, he of Crocodile City, namely Horus, the one who is in the midst of Crocodile City, Shedek, who appears in glory by means of Wajet, another name for the serpent goddess, who is beautiful by means of his great eye, which is under his eyebrow. Verily, she guides the nine bows, even when she issues commands to the nine troops of protection. She causes the power of Apophis, who is in the darkness outside, to flee, so she can drive away other serpents. Even when she puts slaughter and blood into her enemies, her name is blood red. Let the coiled one, Awaken in peace with the awakening of your spirit, being in a state of peace also, and your crown has been established on the head of, of Sobek and all the other gods. 
even that you appear on his forehead as a serpent uh, in your name great of magic let the gods fear you and let the living and the dead fall upon their faces before you i say awake in peace great queen awake in peace may thy awakening be peaceful awake in peace snake that is on the brow of a king awake in peace thine awakening is peaceful awake in peace upper egyptian snake awake in peace thine awakening is peaceful awake in peace renenotet awake in peace thine awakening is peaceful i say awake in peace uto the dawn splendidly figured awake in peace thine awakening be peaceful awake in peace thou head is erect with a wide neck awake awake in peace thine awakening be peaceful awake in peace thou with a head erect with graceful neck awake in peace thine awakening is peaceful awake in peace thou cat awake in peace thine awakening is always peaceful and awake in peace scribe who binds the papyrus bundle awake in peace thine awakening is peaceful awakening in, in peace who points to the place in the fields awake in peace thine awakening is peaceful and awake in peace royal serpent awake in peace thine awakening is always peaceful mm -hmm.